Our next speaker is Tom Heinzman, who practices law with the McCarthy firm and who is going to speak to us about damages in non-personal injury tort cases. Uh, Tom uh, was uh, not just educated in this uh, province at Osgoode Hall where he was a silver medalist, but also uh, obtained degrees at Harvard University in economics and at the University of London where he also got an LLB. He too won the Chancellor Van Conant Scholarship at Osgoode Hall. He uh, is not only a member of the Bar of Ontario, but uh, he and George Finlayson got called in some mysterious way to the Bar of Newfoundland, and as I understand, somehow they're representing Quebec against Newfoundland in the courts of Newfoundland, and uh, you can figure that out if you can. Uh, Tom is a director of the Harvard Club in Toronto, has numerous other honors, and um, is, uh, to anybody who knows him, uh, is, is one of the most vigorous council with one of the most uh, busy and varied practices in this city. Uh, and it's uh, not often that one resorts to uh, case law in introducing someone, but I do bring to your attention the words of no less than Mr. Justice Arnup in the case of Maskowitz back in 1974. And uh, he said, when dealing with Tom Einsman's argument, he said, at the risk of doing an injustice to the brilliant and helpful argument of Mr. Heinzman, I venture to summarize his argument in this way, and he went on. So a nicer bouquet from the uh, bench one is rarely um, likely to see. Uh, I won't at this time go into Tom's politics, but suffice it to say that his chances of a federal appointment are better than those of a provincial <laughs> appointment. I'll give you Tom Heinzman. Thank you, Burke. I'm not going to talk about the full scope of tort damages because we wouldn't have time this morning to do that. So I intend to limit my remarks to the scope of recovery uh, of damages in negligence, and in particular, the treatment of the Wagon Mound case in Canada, and also the scope of recovery of pure economic loss in Canada, again in the tort of negligence. When I started to prepare this paper, I vowed to myself that I would not talk about issues of liability and negligence. That is, whether a duty of care exists or whether there's been a breach of that duty. But as I read the cases, I quickly came to the conclusion that what was wrong with the courts and maybe counsel's treatment of damages in this field is that principles relating to liability have dominated the court's consideration of issues of damage and obscured, it will be my remarks this morning, obscured the proper principles upon which the court ought to have developed the principles relating to the scope of recovery in negligence. Now if we can go back and if I can start first with a treatment of the issue of the recovery of damages based upon foreseeability, because that is the principle that the Privy Council adopted in the Wagamound case, of which I'm sure you're all aware. Before the Wagamound case, the principle of recovery and the principle of the limits of recovery had been adopted back in the 1880s by the English courts as being on the basis of cause and causation. And in the Polemus case, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, thank you, I don't want to be Mr. Cherniak for too long. <laughs> it's well to remember the remarks of Lord Justice Warrington in the Polemus case, where he said, the result may be summarized as follows. The presence or absence of reasonable anticipation of damage determines the legal quality of the act as negligent or innocent. If it be thus determined to be negligent, then the question whether particular damages are recoverable 
depends only on the answer to the question whether they are the direct consequence of the act. So causation was the sole test under polemus for the limits of recoverable damage in negligence. Now it's interesting to know that the polemus case was firmly adopted by our appellate division in two cases Jeffrey and Copeland Flower Mills in 1922, that's a year after Polemus, and again in Smith and London and Southwestern Railway, where Mr. Justice Rose said in the most categorical terms, those cases make it plain that the consequences which may reasonably be expected to result from a particular act are material only in reference to the question whether the act is or is not a negligent act. And that given the negligence and given the damage as a direct result of that negligence, the anticipation of the person whose negligent act has produced the damage is irrelevant, even if the damage differs not only in extent, but in type from the damage that might have been anticipated. Even if the damage differs not only in extent, but in type from the damage that might have been anticipated. Now, the Polemus case was widely attacked by academic writers, and it was overruled in the Wagon Mound case, the facts of which I'm sure you're uh, well aware of, that a spill of oil in a harbor caused a fire, an explosion to a ship, which the trial judge found was unforeseeable in Wagon Mound number one, as that case is known. And the Privy Council, in addressing its mind, and it's a very erudite judgment, that Privy Council decision, decided that what had happened in Polemus put the law of damages in tort out of harmony with the substantive law of negligence and the substantive and damage law of contract. What they said was that if foreseeability is the proper test for a duty of care, it's the proper test for the scope of recoverable damage. And they also said that since foreseeability of damage is the proper test in contract, and that, in that regard they were referring to Hadley and Baxendale, it is also the appropriate test in tort and in negligence. Now it's interesting to remark that since that time, the House of Lords, in a case, Zarnikow versus Kufus, in 1969, appears to have departed from the principle that the scope of recoverable damage in contract is the same as in tort, and in particular the tort of negligence, and appears to have said, although there's great controversy about this, that the limit of recoverable damages in contract is less and should be less than it is in tort. That problem was dealt with in the Supreme Court of Canada in Asamara Oil and Sea Oil and General Corporation in 1979. And Mr. Justice Esty appears to have arrived at the conclusion that Zarnikow says that the limits of damage in contract and negligence should be the same. Whereas I think a reading of Zarnikow would indicate the contrary. In any event, Zarnikow was interpreted in subsequent Court of Appeal decisions in England to say that the limits should be the same. Be that as it may, one of the real factors that the Privy Council looked at in the Wagon Mound was redirecting the law of damages and the limits of recoverable damage in negligence to be in conformity with substantive law. For whatever reason, it's hard to understand because it seems to me and subsequent courts have had to wrestle with this, that the principles that apply to recoverable damage aren't necessarily those which apply to negligence in the first place, the existence of a duty of care. Now the first problem that the wagon mound throws up is what happens when the damage occurs in a way that nobody reasonably could have foreseen. And that was the problem that the House of Lords dealt with in Hughes versus the Lord Advocate. And you are probably aware of that case and the fact that it involved a little boy of eight uh, 
who was playing around a manhole beside which a paraffin lamp had been left by the workman who had gone away, that somehow he knocked the paraffin lamp over, it fell into the manhole, the manhole exploded, causing him to fall into the manhole where he was severely damaged. Now everybody conceded that that sequence of events was entirely unforeseeable. But everybody also conceded, or it was so held, that the possibility of damage to the boy on the surface by being burnt if the paraffin lamp had fallen over was foreseeable. So that the court was faced with the question as to whether it is the, it is the kind of damage that ultimately results or the scenario that leads to that result which is important. And the House of Lords said it's the first. It is the kind of damage that results and not the scenario that leads to that result which is important. And I think it's important to reflect on what Lord Reed said. He said, if the lamp fell and broke, it was not at all unlikely that the boy would be burnt and that the burns might well be serious. No doubt it was not to be expected that the injuries would be as serious as those which the appellant in fact sustained. But a defender is liable, although the damage may be a good deal greater in extent than was foreseeable. He can only escape liability if the damage can be regarded as differing in kind from what was foreseeable. And Lord Pierce said, the defenders are liable for all the foreseeable consequences of their ne neglect. When an accident is of a different type and kind, type and kind, from anything the defender could have foreseen, he is not liable for it, referring to the wagon mount. But to demand a too great a precision in the test of foreseeability would be unfair to the pursuer, since the facets of misadventure are innumerable. So the damage by burn was foreseeable to the boy, but not in the particular way that it occurred. But the House of Lords was saying clearly, and many of the same members were in that court as in the wagon mound, that it is the kind of foreseeable damage that is important and not the scenario leading up to that result. And that's really what the, the Privy Council had said in the wagon mound, where they said, the essential factor in determining liability is whether the damage is of such a kind as the reasonable man should have foreseen. Now, immediately following that decision in Hughes and in the Wagon Mount, the court then had to wrestle with the thin skull cases. And probably the most famous thin skull case was Smith and Leach Brain, where a man had a predisposition to cancer, which was set off by a burn he received in, a, in the course of an industrial accident, and because of his predisposition, he died, which was not a foreseeable result of merely receiving a burn to his lip. And in that case, it was held that the damage was of the same kind as what was foreseeable. And therefore, he was entitled to recover the full degree of the damage because it was of the same kind as that which was foreseeable. Now it seems to me that there really are three bases upon which one could determine foreseeability. The first is what I will call the last kind of damage. And that's basically what the Hughes case stands for. It's the last kind of damage that the plaintiff suffered, burns, that must be reasonably foreseeable. But it, in, in shaping that kind of damage, one should be very broad in classifying that class. The second way of looking at it is to look at the first kind of damage. And Smith and Leach's brain is really an example of that, that a burn was reasonably foreseeable, and therefore you look to the first kind of damage that the plaintiff suffered, and anything flowing out of that is recoverable as being a matter of degree. The third test, if one could call it that, is what I will call the means test. You look to the means by which the plaintiff suffered his damage, uh, 
and determine whether that was reasonably foreseeable. And if the wagon mound and the Hughes case stands for anything, it stands for the proposition that the means test is not the appropriate test. It doesn't matter how the damage occurred. What you do is think of whether what actually occurred, whether it's the first kind or the last kind of damage, whether that kind of damage put in a broad category was reasonably foreseeable. Now, I'd like to test that proposition and that analysis against three cases that Mr. Justice Dixon, who in my view is the judge in the Supreme Court who's most knowledgeable in these issues, aside from our learned first speaker, um, has dealt with these issues both as a trial judge, a court of appeal judge, and a Supreme Court of Canada judge. And, and they're an interesting trilogy of cases. The first was Mackenzie and Hyde back in uh, 1967 in Manitoba, where plaintiffs had suffered damages to their house when somebody had excavated a gas pipe with resultant explosion. Now the explosion had occurred in a way that nobody could foresee because instead of the gas escaping to the atmosphere and exploding there and perhaps causing relatively little damage, the gas, because of certain particular circumstances, seeped along the ground and into the basements of these houses and then exploded. And it, the defendants led evidence to say that that was not reasonably foreseeable. And his lordship said, I hold that the occurrence of damage to the plaintiff's property as a result of the breaking of the gas line was reasonably foreseeable. I confess that I am at a loss to know how the damage and the explosion can properly be termed freakish or one in a million. If gas escapes into the atmosphere and a spark is present, a violent explosion is highly probable. If plaintiff suffers damages as a result of the seeping gas being ignited outdoors, I do not see how it could prop properly be argued that the occurrence of the damage was not reasonably foreseeable. And he goes on to say that the mere fact that it happened in another way does not limit the scope of recoverable damage. So what he is addressing his mind to is the actual result, placing it into a kind of, a kind category and concluding that it doesn't matter how it occurred, that kind of damage was reasonably foreseeable. His Lordship addressed the same issue in School Division of Assiniboine South versus Hoffer. And in that case, a, a snowmobile, which was being started by a 14-year-old boy, ran out of control and fractured a gas riser pipe located near a school with the allegedly unforeseeable result of, of a violent explosion. It just happened that there was a gas riser where the snowmobile hit the school. And his lordship said, interestingly, enough, he said, it might be well argued that damage by impact is to be expected when a machine runs amok, but not damage by fire or explosion. And what his lordship was thinking back to there was Repolemus, because in Repolemus it was the dropping of a plank of wood, and damage by impact was the only foreseeable damage which caused a violent explosion for which the defendants were held liable even though the results were unexpected. And that was the result that the wagon mound had commented upon adversely. And his lordship said in the Assiniboine case, it is enough to fix liability if one could foresee in a general way the sort of thing that happened. The extent of the damage and its manner of incident need not be foreseeable if physical damage of the kind which in fact ensued is foreseeable. Now, let's take those principles and apply it to the case of the Queen versus Cote in 1975, which is a personal injury case, but to me most dramatically exemplifies the need to be clear about the principles that one is dealing with. In the Queen versus Cote 
Mr. Cote was driving down the highway and touched the car in front of him, which caused that car, because of the icy highway, to go out of control across the road and caused a fatal accident with the car coming the other way. And the issue in the case was, was Mr. Cote and the Department of Highways, because of the icy condition, liable to the plaintiff? And what I think, the, the court decided the case in three different ways. Four of the judges, agreeing with Mr. Justice Dixon, said that Mr. Cote was 75% responsible and the Department of Highways 25% responsible. Three of the judges, agreeing with Mr. Justice de Grand Pre, I think it was three, said that Mr. Cote was entirely responsible. And two of the judges, agreeing with Mr. Justice Pigeon, said that the Department of Highways was entirely responsible. Now it's, I would suggest, highly unsatisfactory to have our highest court arrive at three different decisions in the one case based upon the same facts. And I suggest to you that the real reason that it happened was that the court was not thinking about the basis upon which the limits of recoverable damage should be made. Now Mr. Justice Dixon, I think, properly addressed the question as a matter relating to the scope of recovery and not a question of liability. It's hard to believe that a driver on a highway does not have a duty of care to the driver in front of him and the driver coming the other way. So I would have thought that there would be no question of duty of care. Secondly, it's hard to believe that the Department of Highways does not have a duty of care to people driving on the highway. So again, I would have thought it was only a question of the scope of recoverable damage and then placing those two scopes beside one another, deciding how they overlap. But what I think happened was that Mr. Justice Dixon did look at the matter on the basis of, of the scope of recovery and not on the question of Sorry, he looked at it on the basis of scope of recovery and not on the basis of liability. And he said, the impugned act or omission lay in permitting to continue for some hours a treacherous, slippery, and dangerous icy condition upon a short stretch of much traveled highway with a known tendency to ice up. It would seem to me that a reasonable person familiar with Canadian winters should have anticipated a vehicle collision or collisions as the natural and indeed probable result of such a condition of manifest danger. It is not necessary that one foresee the precise con concatenation of events. It is enough to fix liability if one can see, foresee in a general way the class or character of injury which occurred, referring to the wagon mount. And he concluded that that class or character of injury, namely an automobile accident, was clearly foreseeable as a result of the department's negligence. Whereas Mr. Justice de Grand Pre, in my respectful submission, looked at it as a matter of causation. That is, must you foresee or be able to foresee the consequence and the series of events leading to that damage? And he said, put another way, the question is as follows. Should the department, guided by the standards of the reasonable man, have foreseen the combination in time and space of all these factors which taken together produced this unfortunate accident? I think not. And he also appears to have approached the matter not on the basis of scope of damage but on the basis of liability. He says, I have set aside the findings of the Court of Appeal that the Department of Highways should be ordered to pay part of the damages because in my view it committed no fault giving rise to liability, which is hard to understand if, if, you're, if, he, if his lordship was directing his mind to the question of a duty and a breach of that duty by leaving the highway in that condition. And I would respectfully suggest that his lordship was incorrect if he was approaching the problem in the light of the wagon mount and Hughes and the Lord Advocate to be concerned with the 
series of events which gave rise to the ultimate result and should have directed his mind to whether that kind of result was reasonably foreseeable irregardless of how the actual damage occurred. And the, if one looks at the judgment of Mr. Justice Pigeon, the reason he dissented, I would suggest, is because he too closely limited the class of damage, where he said, it is inconceivable, I'm sorry, He determined the, that the issue in question was whether a fatal accident could have occurred or was reasonably foreseeable, rather than whether an accident was foreseeable. And I would suggest to you that by limiting it in that fashion, he improperly limited the scope of foreseeable damage. He said, in my view, applying the test of foreseeability in a reasonable and realistic way means asking the question whether a fatal head-on collision is a possible consequence of an earlier insignificant rear-end impact. And surely, limiting the kind of foreseeable damage to that narrow a classification, that is, a fatal head-on collision rather than a collision, was an undue limitation of the kind of damage approach that Hughes and the Lord Advocate directed us to, to take. Now, these kinds of problems and this kind of analysis is not just important when one is dealing with one defendant, but as the Cote case indicates, really become more and more difficult if you are dealing with two or more defendants because it's only if one properly approaches, I would suggest, the question of the scope of recoverable damage that one can properly allocate that risk and that scope amongst several defendants. Or indeed, if the plaintiff is responsible, partly, between the plaintiff and the defendant. There's a whole host of problems that one gets into when one is talking about contributory negligence. And the, court has never, the courts have never really enunciated the basis upon which contribution should be allocated. For instance, should it be allocated on the cost of either of the parties to have avoided the risk? Or should it be allocated on the basis of the foreseeability of the final result? Or on the causal link between each of the defendant's acts and the result. None of these principles have been adequately addressed by the courts. But what has even exacerbated the problem, I would suggest, is that the courts have not clearly enunciated the basis of remoteness of damage in the first place in order to determine how the remoteness issue applies to each of the parties at fault. As far as I'm concerned, the present status of the law relating to recoverable damage and negligence leaves a tremendous amount of discretion in the judge or jury because it places the concept of foreseeability as the sole criteria to determine uh, recoverable damage. And what is foreseeable, foreseeable to one person who has no experience, practical experience in the events with which the court is concerned may not be foreseeable to someone else. Foreseeability is a very unruly horse to put the limits of recoverable damage upon. May I then turn to the question of the recoverability of pure economic loss. And by pure economic loss, I mean economic loss in the absence of any physical injury or injury to property. Now, if we're, one were making the punishment fit the crime, and since recovery of damages is entirely an economic result, one might arrive at the conclusion that economic loss is the very thing which the courts ought to award. 
damages for. But the reverse has been, in fact, the case for obvious policy reasons. From very early on, the English courts arrived at the conclusion in a number of decisions in the late 1800s that a plaintiff could not recover pure economic loss, that is, loss of profit, if he had not suffered any damage to person or property. As I say, I, I think that on a rational basis, that is not a defensible position. And our Court of Appeal in 1959 had the opportunity to completely avoid that approach and hold that foreseeability of economic loss is the sole criteria in the Seaway Hotels versus Consumers Gas case, where the hotel had suffered loss by reason of the gas pipe to their premises being fractured, they being deprived of gas and uh, electricity, and uh, thereby suffering loss. Now, at the trial division, Mr. Justice McLennan approached the issue entirely as the English courts had done. And he found that since the hotel had, in fact, suffered some property damage due to food spoilage, they were entitled to recover their full economic loss in terms of loss of bar revenue, loss of rooms, etc. And the Court of Appeal didn't approach the matter that way. They approached it entirely on the basis of foreseeability. Was economic loss foreseeable? And the Court of Appeal said, it is quite certain that the injury for which claim is made in this case was injury that was likely to follow from the interference with the electric duct. It was injury which ought reasonably to have been foreseen by the defendants. I am satisfied that the defendants would know that interference with the duct shown in the plan in their possession before the work of construction was commenced and interference with the supply of elec electricity energy through that duct would cause damage to the persons entitled to receive that supply of electric energy. And then referring to Bolton and Stone, the court said the defendants ought reasonably to have foreseen the injury that resulted from interference with the duct. As they say, that case ought to have permitted, if our courts wish to do so, to look at the question of the foreseeability of economic loss, irregardless of the foreseeability or actual occurrence of physical injury as being the sole criteria to award economic loss upon. Now let's go back and look at the question of damages for negligent misrepresentation because the largest development of the law in this area has arisen out of that area of the law. In Candler versus Crane Christmas, I'm sure you're all aware that the English Court of Appeal in 1951 held that damages for negligent misrepresentation could not be awarded. In that case, the delivery of a false or inaccurate auditing statement. But it's important to realize that the court approached the matter, first of all, on the basis of liability, that there cannot be liability for a negligent misrepresentation. It has to be fraudulent or something more than negligent, following dairy and peak. But secondly, on the basis that recovery for economic loss was not permitted. And there was only economic loss in the, case, in the case of reliance upon a, a false auditing statement. Now, when the House of Lords in Headley, Byrne, and Heller overruled Candler versus Crane Christmas, they overruled both those propositions, both that you cannot have recovery for a negligent misrepresentation and also that you cannot have recovery for pure economic loss. And my paper will quote in detail from Mr. Justice Devlin's judgment, where he says that that idea that you cannot have recovery for pure economic loss cannot be based upon any principles of law or reason. And he goes on to hold that the principles of Donahue and Stephen apply 
and I quote, where as a result of the negligence, no damage was done to person or to property and the consequential loss was purely financial. Now it might be thought that Headley Byrne would then put to rest uh, or eliminate the criteria that there must be physical damage to person or property in order that economic loss might be recoverable. But that was not the case. What the, court, what the courts went on to find was that in order for there to be recovery of economic loss, there must be an immediate relationship between the plaintiff and the defendant. And that anything less than an immediate relationship will not give rise to liability for economic loss in the absence of physical injury. And they relied heavily on the dicta of Lord Atkin in Donahue and Stevenson, which was quoted by Mr. Justice Esty in his opening remarks, where Lord Atkin said, who then in law is my neighbor? The answer seems to be persons who are so closely and directly affected by my act that I ought reasonably to have them in contemplation as being so affected when I am directing my mind to acts or omissions which are called in question. And I emphasize that he did not say as being affected, there may very well be an effect, but as being so affected when I am directing my mind to acts or omissions which are called in question. And that's the basis upon which Mr. Justice Widgery decided the very famous case of Weller versus Foot and Mouth Disease Research Institute, which you're all aware of, I'm sure, and in which case the defendants had allowed a virus to escape uh, from their premises, which caused cattle uh, to be infected with resultant damage to all sorts of people involved in the cattle business. And what his lordship said was, there was reasonably foreseeable damage to property. That being the case, it's only those persons whose property is damaged who can recover. Anybody else who stands at a second remove from those persons cannot recover their economic loss. Now in Rivto Marine, Rivto Marine versus Washington Iron Works, the Supreme Court of Canada adopted Hedley, Byrne and Heller, virtually adopted Hedley, Byrne and Heller and held that if a duty of care exists and if there is a breach of that duty, then economic loss, pure economic loss, is recoverable. And I commend to you the reading of that case. It's an important case because the Supreme Court of Canada held that there is no duty of care between a manufacturer and user of an article to take care in the manufacture of that article. There's no duty of care, which is a surprising uh, result, but that's what they held. There is a duty of care if they learn of circumstances which called upon the manufacturer to warn the user. And failing to warn the user resulted in liability. And then they went on to determine that liability existing, recoverable, recoverability of pure economic loss was now the case in Canada. Now, if we can then just stand back and, and examine where we are with re respect to the recoverability of pure economic loss in Canada. First of all, obviously, if there's injury to property or person uh, leading to that damage, that economic damage. Secondly, if there is an immediate relationship between the parties, and usually that relationship will arise out of words spoken or advice given. And if a person gives advice uh, and holds himself out as competent and willing to give that advice, then he will, generally speaking, be held liable in the absence of some exculpatory wording such as in Hedley, Byrne, and Heller. And I'll just give you a few examples where this has been held to be the case. Uh, obviously, an accountant giving financial statements relied upon by an investor, and that's the Supreme Court of Canada case of Hague and Bamford, 
a bank reference utilized by an investor or a, uh, or a creditor, and that's Headley Byrne, an engineer performing services uh, not directly for an owner, but he knows that the owner is going to rely upon that advice, a trust company advising with respect to uh, retirement savings plans, an advertising agency uh, advising on the propriety of, of advertising, a real estate agent acting for a vendor has been held liable to a purchaser when uh, his advice was given to the purchaser. A solicitor acting for a purchaser has had been held liable to the vendor when he purported to advise, or give some advice to the opposite party. All of these people placed themselves in a position of giving advice. There was a direct relationship between them and therefore economic loss was recoverable. The most interesting recent decision dealing with a more remote situation is Hunt versus T.W. Johnson Company Limited, a decision of um, Mr. Justice Hughes in this province, where a factory burnt down as a result of the negligence of the defendant. And in that factory, both a manufacturer and a distributor carried on business. The distributor sold the goods of the manufacturer. They were both owned by the same gentleman, both companies. And Mr. Justice Hughes held that the sales company could not recover its pure economic loss because the factory being burnt down, there were no goods received by the distributor, and he suffered loss of profits. He could not recover that damage even though he was in the same building as the manufacturer. It seems that if there was ever a direct relationship outside of an absolutely direct confrontation between the parties, there was one in that case. And his lordship adopted the language of Lord Denning in a case in England in 1970 where Lord Denning, uh, in discussing Headley Byrne, said uh, that while Lord Devlin in that case said that there should be no rational distinction between recovery of economic loss and recovery of, of personal injury loss, said, there may be no difference in logic, but I think that there is a great difference in common sense. The law is the embodiment of common sense, or at any rate it should be. In actions of negligence, when the plaintiff has suffered no damage to his person or property, but has only sustained economic loss, the law does not usually permit him to recover that loss. The reason lies in public policy. And uh, I would suggest to you that Mr. Justice Hughes had the ability to apply the Seaway Hotel case and say that's not the law of Ontario. He had the ability to apply the Rivto case and find a duty of care because Lord, Devlin, Lord Denning had not been addressing his mind to the duty or breach of duty. He'd been directing his mind to limits of recoverable damage. And Mr. Justice Hughes could have awarded damage to the distributor in those circumstances, but he didn't. And that, I think, is where the law of Ontario presently stands, that unless there is such an immediate relationship or a more immediate relationship than there was in this case, that economic loss is not recoverable. I think the net result of all of, all of those cases is that the court in addressing damage issues, in addressing, for instance, the issue of economic loss recovery, thinks in terms of principles of liability. It concerns itself with whether liability exists. And I suggest that what ought to have occurred in that case was that a duty of care ought to have been found to exist. And that what really ought to be addressed is the question of the scope of recoverable damage. And that if economic loss is foreseeable, and if there is a sufficiently proximate relationship between the plaintiff and the defendant, then recovery ought to be allowed. I think I've run out of time, so I'll stop there. Thank you.